go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross a catholic take what you need to know right now a bold synthesis of inspiration and information keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous catholic perspective a Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it is great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Toxic femininity versus Catholic femininity. Catholic femininity versus the world. We're going to have that conversation today with Angela Erickson from The Integrated Life. You might recall Angela. She was sub-hosting for us on the Ask a Priest Live program, which is heard 6 p.m. Eastern all across the Station of the Cross media network. And uh, she did a great job filling in for us. But she has a YouTube channel called Integrated with Angela Erickson. We're, today we're going to be talking about those deep, dark contrasts between what we believe and what the world wants to sell. And which reminds me, I don't know if you caught it, but last night I released my expose on Catholic Relief Services not only did I go to the press conference in uh, Front Royal, Virginia, but I sat down with Steve Mosier, with Michael Hitchborn and Rob Gaspers, and we talked about the report. I asked some interesting questions, and I got some, I would say, difficult responses because it's a troubling story, to say the least, on what Catholic Relief Services has been doing in Africa, talking about toxic femininity. There's a lot of that in this story as well. So make sure to go to the show notes today to find the link and watch that video and share it with a friend. I'd be grateful to you. But a lot to cover. And everything gets put into the show notes over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T. Let's pray. Let's get started. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your saint of the day. St. Cuthbert, pray for us. Cuthbert was born in Northumbria around the year 635 and spent his early life as a shepherd near Melrose Abbey in what is now Scotland. One night, Cuthbert witnessed the soul of the Abbey's founder, St. Aidan of Lindisfarne, carried up to heaven by angels. Inspired to a vocation, Cuthbert soon joined the monastery, led by the abbot St. Ayata, and studied scripture under St. Boisel, also known as St. Boswell. Cuthbert succeeded Boisel as the monastery's prior, then eventually became prior of Lindisfarne, also under St. Ayata, where Cuthbert strove patiently to introduce newly obligatory Roman customs in place of Celtic practices. After many years, Cuthbert eventually retired to a hermitage, but before long he was chosen as Bishop of Lindisfarne, an office he reluctantly accepted only after intense pressure. Within two years, Cuthbert resigned to prepare for his approaching death, which came on March 20th in the year of our Lord 687. His good friend, St. Herbert of Derwentwater, entered heaven the same day. Known as the Wonder Worker of England for his many miracles as abbot, as bishop, and after death, Cuthbert was possibly the most popular saint in England until the martyrdom of St. Thomas Becket. For more about this day and others in the Church's calendar, visit thestationofthecross.com slash saintsandseasons. St. Cuthbert, pray for us. And now your headline news. Daily Wire reports mandatory bar exam next in Washington state over equity concerns. In a pair of orders last Friday, the Washington Supreme Court approved alternative pathways to lawyer licensure. The bar exam will no longer be required for people who want to practice law in Washington state. The decision follows recommendations made by the state's Bar Licensure Task Force, which was formed in 2020 to examine the issue. The task Force recommended getting rid of the mandatory bar exam in order to advance the cause of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Hmm. LifeSite News reports head of German Franciscans defends homosexuality and transgenderism. 
It's upside down world, isn't it? The provincial superior of the German Franciscans, who has openly declared himself to be a homosexual, attacked Catholic teaching on sexuality and defended homosexuality and gendered fluidity as, quote, wonderful diversity from God, close quote. In an interview with the German bishop's news outlet, Friar Marcus Furman rejected Catholic teaching, saying he finds the language of the church teaching and those who defend it to be derogatory and discriminatory, claiming the support of modern science for gender diversity and attributing this diversity to God as its source. Others might say that is blasphemy. Anyway, Daily Signal reports... Biden presides over record-breaking 11 embassy evacuations. With the recent evacuation of the embassy in Haiti, the Biden administration has presided over more evacuations of U.S. embassies, a total of 11, than any other presidential administration in U.S. history. President Barack Obama presided over the second most embassy evacuations of any, with a total of eight over two terms. That's one per year. Donald Trump had three over the course of his four years. And those, those are your headline news. Yikes. Yikes to say the least. The gospel today comes to us from John chapter 8, verses 31 through 42. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples, and you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Amen. Amen, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in a household forever, but a son always remains. So if the Son frees you, then you will truly be free. I know that you are descendants of Abraham, but you are trying to kill me, because my word has no room among you. I tell you what I have seen in the Father's presence, then do what you have heard from the Father. They answered and said to him, Our father is Abraham. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You are doing the works of your father. So they said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God. And am here. I did not come on my own, but he sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I just want you to put yourself in the moment. If you're driving, don't close your eyes. But otherwise, close your eyes and just imagine in your mind, you're standing there. Jesus is right in front of you. He's looking at you. You're the crowd. And he is saying these words to you. Like, he is God. And he is saying these words to you. He's basically rejecting you. Who is their father? Father McKeevely has a lot to say today. He's writing back in the 19th century. He says, from the work they did, it might be easily seen who their father was, whose works they imitated. Jesus is throwing digs here. He is, he is laying it down. Your father is the devil is essentially what's insinuated there. I want you to imagine him saying that to you. Would that crush your heart? I mean, I think it would. I'm pretty sure it should. Father McKeevely goes on, and you shall know the truth by persevering in my doctrine. You shall know by experience and practice and shall taste how true are all things you believe of me and how solitary is my doctrine and teaching. This knowledge of faith and truth will free and emancipate you from the servitude of sin and the tyranny of your passions. The tyranny of your passions. I want you to let that sink in today. The tyranny of your passions. What passions are you failing to conquer this Lenten season? Is it gluttony? Slothfulness? 
Is it, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the tyranny of the passions of the sixth and ninth commandments? Is it indulgence of some kind or another? The tyranny of your passions. I got to tell you, I felt truly a slave of my passions when I had an interior locution sitting in RCIA class going back to 1998. When they read the uh, Beatitudes, I remember having like time stand still. And the thought came to my mind that this is true. Blessed are the pure in spirit, for they shall see God. And I said to myself, I will never see God because I am a slave to pornography. I am a slave to my disordered passions. And I remember having this insane clear thought in my mind. I would have never had that on my own. That was a grace of God. Father McKeevely goes on. And we have never been slaves. This is in reference to their fathers would be untrue, who were slaves to the Egyptians, the Babylonians, etc. So what does he mean? They are slaves to sin, and they are rejecting the antidote to sin. God, who has taken upon flesh and dwelt among us, who stands there and looks at us and warns us, but we don't listen. And he's telling us, that the time of mercy comes to an end and the time of judgment will happen. And we will be judged for how we have lived this life, for how we have responded to this message. How many will listen? How many won't? Unfortunately, too many of those Jews rejected him. And they were visited in 70 AD. And their temple was torn down. And their descendants today are trying to rebuild that temple, the third temple, which will become the temple of the Antichrist. And many of the faithful will be persecuted under the tyranny of the Antichrist. Let us not be slaves to sin or the Antichrist. Let us embrace Jesus Christ, the only way to the Father. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Be to Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Tick, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Coming up at 30 past the hour, we're going to have a conversation with Angela Erickson from Integrated. You can find her on YouTube to search for Integrated Angela. We're going to put a link to it in the show notes today, of course. We're going to talk about Catholic femininity versus the world versus toxic femininity. Speaking of which, I just released an expose on Catholic Relief Services. Uh, I I released it last night on the YouTube channel. We're going to put it in the show notes today, of course, for you. It's also going to be available on ICR Plus tab on the iCatholic Radio mobile app. So make sure to download that today in your iOS or Android app store. Let me play just the first 60 seconds for you to give you a teaser here. Best outcome would be for CRS to actually be Catholic and to propagate the faith. Catholic Relief Services signed on to the idea that condoms are 98% effective. If you're feeding bellies and giving them the poison of masturbation and contraception and condoms. Oh, I think they have multiple reasons to want to destroy the uh, African culture, which is very pro-life and very pro-family and recognizes the fundamental distinction between men and women. Well, now you're murdering their, their bodies and their souls. Yeah. And you're doing it in the service of charity. I mean, we put a lot of time and effort to make sure that these reports are as objective and accurate as possible. The best outcome would be for CRS to be completely extricated from government funding, from these private foundations like Bill and Melinda Gates, Soros Fund, any entity that has as their goal the spread of contraception. Don't Don't partner with them. Don't partner with them. Let's let's ponder that today. Don't partner with them. You can find the hour-long sit-down with Steve Mosier, Michael Hitchborn, and Rob Gaspers on the YouTube channel or on ICR Plus tab today. Check that out. But I saw this article over on uh, the Catholic thing, catholicthing.org, Where is the Laughter by Dr. Kerry Gress. And I thought it would be very good to share this with you because today we're tackling this, the topic of Catholic femininity. And it's, uh, I think this is a very important point when it comes to family life, the modern world versus the traditional view of marriage between a man and a woman and raising children and having a home that is filled with joy, laughter, and sometimes tears, you know, sometimes issues. But nonetheless, there seems to be something missing. And this article touches on that. Here it goes. 
A few years ago, I read a series of World War II novels with rather unsatisfying endings. After epic stories of war, bloodshed, human cruelty, and the strong hand of fate, these novels concluded with men who returned home from the war, abandoning their childhood faith. In its place, they embraced a kind of cynical maturity, thinking that they were all the wiser than their than the superstitions of old. While frustrated by these books, I finally realized that they ended this way because this is actually what happened to so many veterans of the Second World War. Their scars and brokenness created a vacuum in the culture where ideologies could grow wild like uh, Virginia Vines, pushing out what many came to believe was tired and wanting. Now, let this sink in. This is the greatest generation, the greatest generation who went and fought the Nazis, the greatest generation who pushed back on the tyranny that was pervading in Europe at the time. And yet so many problems resulted from that greatest generation. Divorce on demand, the sexual revolution, and so many other issues. The article goes on, Dr. Gress Uh, says, for nearly three generations, as most of these World War II veterans have now gone to their eternal rest, these ideas have gripped families, leading children and grandchildren to grasp at any and every whim of the heart while avoiding the tiresome rituals of an age-old church. I recently met an Irish-American writer, Jenny Holland, who is a Gen X granddaughter of this old guard living in Belfast. Holland, who considers herself a non-believer and politically homeless, is critical of her forebears who, unfettered from faith, were confident that they had found something better. She is deeply troubled by the dramatic rise in behavior that can only be called pure evil. She writes about her Irish father at her substack. I adored my father, but he and other boomers thought that they had it all figured out that they could have their cake and eat it too, and their offspring would enjoy the fruits of liberalism in perpetuity. Because the only thing liberalism could produce was freedom from their the shackles of dour tradition and superstition. They were wrong. That's very obvious to me now. In response to this, Holland has stated, looking back, weighing with, with new eyes, the things rejected by her parents, aunts and uncles, cousins, and so on. In this search, though not a Catholic, she confesses that somehow she has started saying the rosary. Isn't that amazing? Where do you think that will lead? It goes on. Even without a full arsenal of belief, I can sense the importance of the rosary in this climate as a symbol of purity, love, and hope. It doesn't matter any longer to my cynical and impure Gen X heart that purity is often used as excuse to abuse and castigate. That is not the fault of purity itself, rather those malevolent people who steal it for their own ends. I recently had a Zoom conversation with Holland. She described her mother's side of the family. Her American grandparents guarded their Catholic faith, but... Their 10 children rushed into the wild and the popular. Going deeper into the details, she said something striking. Quote, I remember family dinners at my grandparents' house, and I compare them to our gatherings now, especially since my grandparents have died. And I can't help but thinking, where is the laughter? Close quote. This question isn't limited to just Holland's family. Our lives are meant to be lived in community and populated by our immediate family and the wider rings of our parents' relatives. These are the people with whom we travel through life, sharing Sunday meals, funeral luncheons, wedding feasts, and birthday festivities. These are the people with whom we have collective and borrowed memories. What is your experience, I wonder? How about your family? Do you still laugh, cry together? Do you journey together? Or maybe you're a lot like my family. You're broken. You're separated. You are displaced. There is no laughing and journeying together. You've become hermits and nomads in the wasteland of modernism. That's, that's been my experience. 
In fact, I remember, and I shared this often, that when I met my wife and her crazy Portuguese family, I thought it was weird. They all live in the same town? That's bizarre. <laughs> like, you know your cousins' names? Really? Come now. Seriously. And they laugh together. And they cry together. And they argue together. Like, nobody's business do they argue together. But there is something still there. A remnant of a time gone by. And I can't begin to understand it because I never lived that experience. My experience was completely different. Dr. Grass goes on. Shared events and meals are sometimes awkward, sometimes tedious, often full of bustle and busyness, clatter and cleaning. But more than anything, they should be punctuated by laughter, the kind of laughter that comes from safety and comfort and connection. This is what Holland remembers from her youth. Sadly, these events, if they happen at all now, seem to be punctuated by different kinds of laughter, nervous, sardonic, bitter, or teasing. The political has crept into our family so deeply that the personal no longer has its own space. But politics isn't the root. Pride is ever at play, as Father Dwight Longenecker explains. Quote, the humorists are humans who have humility and who are down to earth. The inability to take a joke or make a joke is one of the hallmarks of pride. Satan never laughs, close quote. The absence of laughter can also mean an absence of safety, an absence of the love that should exist among those who, with whom we are meant to be most intimate. There is little joyful laughter in the child too early exposed to sexuality, in those reaching for porn and or birth control to feed and fix the demands of fertility, in the couple where the husband and wife no longer trust each other with their bond of marriage breaking more than building, or in those creating idols out of unbound freedom. The relentless quest for pleasure, power, or money gnaws at relationships, rotting responsibility and love. The family for modern men and women often feels smothering or enslaving instead of enlivening. We mentioned that yesterday in the toxicity of masculinity in the modern world, didn't we? They don't want relationships. They don't want commitments. They want unfettered passions. They just want to have it their way, kind of like Frank Sinatra, don't they? It seems to be the same is true for women. In current culture, Dr. Grass goes on, Catholic doctrine is frequently mocked as a silly set of rules and regulations, but it turns out to be something much richer, deeper, and healthier than most imagine. It is this overlooked doctrine that has the potential to create the space for laughter, Tables can once again become animated by giggles, goffs, and even snorts as families delight in each other. Do you go out of your way to try to make your kids laugh? I do sometimes. It's a, it's a blast. You should try it. Holland is not alone in the quest for the restoration of laughter. So many people are quietly searching, including those at our tables, pews, and workspaces. Let's hope that their search will lead them to a place so that when, f when future historical novelties draw their books to a close, they will conclude not with doubt and despair, but with peace, hope, and even mirth. You may also enjoy some of these other articles that we're going to link to in the show notes today over at the station of the cross dot com forward slash ACT. That's the article from Dr. Kerry Gress. Where is the laughter? Do you laugh? Do you laugh with your family? Do you cry with your family? Do you enjoy your family? I think marriage is hard. I've been at it now for 24 years. Don't tell my wife, but I would say most of that has been good. She may fact check me on that one. But nonetheless, marriage is hard. Marriage is hard all by itself. It's even harder when you don't trust God. It's even harder when God's not the, at the center of your marriage. It's even harder when you are not, uh, you know, living the Catholic faith as best you can, when you are not making use of the sacramental graces communicated to us through the sacraments and through sacraments, uh, sacramentals, when you don't lead your family in the faith, marriage is that much harder. And it's already very, very difficult. But do you laugh? I got to tell you, in the, my line of work, where I have to be knee deep into the thick of the controversies in the world and in the church, 
that CRS expose video that I released being an example of that. I can't let my kids watch that. It's too, it's too soul crushing, to be honest with you. It is too soul crushing. So it's important for us to find joy in this world, the silver lining, to laugh, to have that moment of community with your family. Before we step over our family to look into the world, to go and to visit the infirmed, the sick, the imprisoned, the, and to clothe the naked and all the rest, let's make sure we do that first and foremost in our homes and in our family. And then and only then can we go out into the world. As I always say, it's time to turn on the lights, let the cockroaches know that they don't own the kitchen. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. What you're offering and giving to me, you deserve to get back because you're offering more than I can give. I learned so much through the station on the cross. I listen to the radio station daily, and I absolutely love it. I was attending the chapel and places like that, and through your programs, I was able to find out how other Protestants had come back into the Catholic Church. God bless the Station of the Cross. Donate today at thestationofthecross.com. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. The Hill reports Supreme Court greenlights Texas law that allows state police to arrest migrants. The Supreme Court yesterday allowed a Texas law to take effect that enables state law enforcement to arrest people they suspect are illegally entering the United States from Mexico. The three liberal justices publicly dissented from the court's order, clearing the way for the controversial statute SB4. The order is not a final decision, and the case could return to the high court. The statute makes illegal immigration a state crime, enabling state and local law enforcement to arrest illegal immigrants who could then face deportation or jail time. And CNA is reporting Pope Francis appoints new bishop to lead Wisconsin diocese. Pope Francis on Tuesday appointed Detroit Auxiliary Bishop Gerard Battersby to lead the Diocese of La Crosse in western Wisconsin after accepting the resignation of Bishop William Callahan. At 63 years old, Battersby will become the 11th bishop to lead the diocese in La Crosse. He was born in Detroit and has been serving there as an auxiliary since 2017. Bishop Callahan is retiring early at 73 for health reasons, and he's been in the diocese since 2010. LifeSite News reports Pope Francis denounces anti-vaxxers. Speaking as part of his newly released memoir, in a series of interviews conducted by journalist Fabio Marchisi Ragona, Pope Francis highlighted his thoughts and responses to COVID-19, including the abortion-tainted COVID jabs and his warm welcome of them. The pontiff rebuked those who did not receive an injection or who voiced opposition to them publicly, saying, quote, deciding whether to get vaccinated is always an ethical choice. But I know that many people signed up to movements opposed to the administration of the medication. This distressed me because, in my view, being against the antidote is an almost suicidal act of denial, close quote. How many of us remember how many people got fired? And their employers quoted Pope Francis along the way. Let that sink in. And those, those are your headline news. Hey, by the way, can I just thank My Catholic Will, mycatholicwill.com forward slash the station of the cross. If you use referral code 14 stations, I hear you get a free will, and you might consider leaving the station of the cross in your will. That would be amazing. Visit mycatholicwill.com forward slash the station of the cross and use referral code 14 stations. That'd be amazing. Hey, we're talking about Catholic femininity versus the world, toxic femininity versus Catholic femininity. And I've invited Angela Erickson to be on the show today. She has a YouTube channel integrated with Angela Erickson. You can find it. On YouTube, just look for Integrated Angela, but we're going to put a link to it in the show notes, of course. And you might recall that Angela filled in for us over on the Ask a Priest Live program when I was in Virginia. Angela, good morning to you. Thanks for being on the team today. Thanks for uh, having me back on. It means a lot. <laughs> Praise be to God. Uh, you did a great job on Ask a Priest Live, by the way. We really appreciated oh, having you. you on our team. So thank you for doing that. We'd love to get you back soon to do that. But I wanted to talk about Catholic femininity versus the world. Yesterday, I dealt with toxic masculinity in a modern world. 
And it seems to be there's a common theme among women. Do you see that as far as I know, men and women are obviously different, that much we know. But as far as the attacks of modernism on women, it seems like there's some common threads here. Well, absolutely. I mean, I think the whole girl boss mentality has really been extremely damaging to the family. Um, I think that that's just nobody can deny that that has been really damaging because it has really severed women from their uh, from their very nature. We're not made to be girl bosses. We are made to be mothers. And uh, the church has always given us the antidote, whether it's in religious life, that maternity that we have um, being expressed in how we how we treat the poor, how we treat orphans, as uh, we saw in Cabrini. She, she called those mm. children her children. And I loved that nurturing portrayal of her. She wept over her children. Uh, but we do that too as mothers. Um, I, I'm pregnant with my sixth child. And uh, that's where God called me. I had a job that I loved and I left it so that I could be home with my children. Uh, and and that's where we're made to find fulfillment. But I do find that a lot of women have been so severed from their identity, severed from their nature, uh, that they have a hard time connecting with motherhood. And those women who cannot figure out a way to integrate their maternity into their identity tend to resent motherhood. And so that's the problem that we face today is how do we get women to a place where they learn how to integrate their motherhood into uh, their daily life in a way that um, expresses the joy that we're meant to have as mothers. I remember when I brought my wife home from work, she was making more money than me. She was a paralegal and uh, we adopted our oldest and we had, we actually had no choice. It wasn't as though we discerned it carefully. We just didn't have a choice. We needed her to come home because we couldn't put him in a school because of the circumstances. And uh, it made us change our entire life and the way we think about things, got us into homeschooling and uh, many of the fruits that we enjoy today through our family. But I remember in those days as my wife was a paralegal, she worked for an attorney. One of the attorneys she worked for was a female. And um, she was young. She was uh, just past the bar. She was excited about her career. And then she got pregnant and had a child. And then she came into the office and wept every single day that she couldn't be home with her child. And I remember my wife being really impacted by that, you know, and it sort of hit her that the world sells uh, sells women one message. And yet the heart of a woman, if they're being honest, really wants a different one. And I think that's kind of what you just hit on. Uh, how hard is it for young women, especially? To, I mean, the, the world seems to be putting on these blinders for them. How hard is it for, for women to accept truth over the lie? Honestly, it is. It's extremely difficult. I actually wrote about this about a year ago in an article that was published in Crisis. Um, the, the article is titled Against, Femini or Against Feminism. Um, but basically, in the, my thesis in the article is that women are are raised to work. Uh, mm -hmm. We spend how countless years in the in education. We we graduate with degrees. We're never prepared for motherhood, though. Um, often, especially for the millennial generation and younger, moms were working, so that wasn't necessarily even modeled for us. Um, so not only was it not modeled for us in the home, but then we're trained for a career. So that's where we feel comfortable. That's where we're trained to feel comfortable. And so for a lot of women, um, you do have women like myself who always, who, who go to work after becoming a mother and they feel torn. I think that's a very common experience, but they're so comfortable in a working environment because that's what they were literally trained to do. They weren't trained to be a mother for many women and fathers, but the first diaper they change is, is the diaper of the first child in the hospital. Um, that's mm. not normal. That's not, that's not uh, how we prepare women for motherhood. And so then when women become mothers, it's so overwhelming because often they're trying to learn how to be a wife for the first time, which is a whole nother learning curve. <laughs> then they become moms and they're learning all of these skills of motherhood that were not passed down to them. They're learning how to cook. They're learning how to clean. They're learning how to bake. They're learning how to take care of a sick child. All of these things seem really overwhelming. They're learning how to breastfeed, all of these things. Um, mm. And it's a lot easier to relegate that duty to somebody else like a daycare provider or the government in public school than it is to take that on yourself and and own that and so a lot of women find it more comfortable to send their kids uh away to these other institutions while they go to work because it's what they know um and so for me i believe that we have to do a better job preparing young women for that role it is the most important role that 
that a woman will ever inhabit. Um, that's that's what we were made for, and that's where our legacy lies. And so if we're not preparing women for that, we are failing them. And I think we've failed a lot of women, which is why we see uh, that feminism has taken such a deep, deep root with this girl boss phenomenon. In the last segment, I read the the article by Dr. Carrie Gress on where is the laughter? And she kind of hit on something you said a minute ago, which is, you know, wasn't passed on. This is something I've talked about a lot too. My wife and I both come from broken homes, marriage, it's sacramental marriage, sacrificial marriage wasn't, wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't shown us. We had no example of it. So for the last 24 years, we kind of feel like we've been making this thing up. We've just been pretending every day in hopes of giving our kids a better example but the same is true in a lot of areas. And you just mentioned them, you know, and it's so true, like how to be a mom, how to be a wife, how to be a husband, how to do certain tasks, which reminds me that, uh, you know, I have me and two of my sons anyway, are a part of the troops of St. George. And a huge part of that is just to have dads show the boys how to do things, how to tie a tie, how to change a tire on a car, et cetera. It's like we've lost this art, and Dr. Kerry Gress hits on this. This, la- this lack of laughter in the home is a symptom of a greater problem. There's no community in the home. There's no mentorship in the home anymore. There's no passing from one generation down to the next and the next generation caring for the elderly in, in, their, in their homes, in their families anymore. It is a lost Art. It is a lost cause, it seems, in many ways. Do you think it's possible to restore that? Do you think we can um, decide this far and no further? You know, I think there is a growing segment of women who are going out of their way to reconnect with their femininity. And I see a lot of promise there. It is difficult because we see on a political level, there's a huge divide. And I think that the chasm is, is really growing right now of, of women and men who are trying to live more in accordance with their nature, um, trying to reconnect with their telos in a lot of ways. Uh, and then there's a segment of the population that is very much determined to be progressive and to always be progressing to an end of which we know not. <laughs> mm. um, and so what we are confronted with is we're just, we're going to have to battle it out. And at the end of the day, I'm hopeful because I feel like we're, and this sounds kind of silly, but it's true. We're going to outbreed them. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's one thing. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm kind of hopeful that um, as more mothers are choosing to stay home and are raising their kids and they're investing time in those relationships. Because mm. I think I, what you're describing too with the broken home situation, which is so prevalent and common. I mean, I experienced that as well. Um, you know, there is that, uh, I think there's a tendency for a lot of emotional neglect in those situations as well. I talked about this with Layla Miller, uh, about her book, Primal Loss, uh, gosh, must've been a year or two ago, but, uh, really uh, the children are the ones at the, at the end of that emotional neglect, um, most of the time because children are expected to be resilient and that's just a lie. Children are not resilient. They adapt. Um, those are very different things. And, uh, and so I do think that with more mothers staying home with husbands, prioritizing work that affords them the opportunity for their wives to stay home and really being serious about that. I hear from women all the time. I want to stay home, but my husband doesn't want to lose my income. And I don't know what to do because I want to be home with my children. What do I say to him? What do I do? Mm. Um, and, uh, we have to prioritize our children again. And the more that we do that, the more that we invest in them, our children will remember that. <laughs> I mean, so we, true. because so many of us are sitting there looking at, oh, gosh, I wish, I wish someone would have been around to help emotional, teach me how to emotionally regulate, for example. Well, children don't learn that unless it's modeled for them and their parents. And if they have a secure attachment with their parents, um, things like that, where they feel safe and provided for it. And a lot of children coming from broken families, uh, life is uncertain because their experience of the world is that the very foundation of their life can be shattered in a moment. Um, so we have to prioritize our children again. We have to invest in them. And my hope is that the segment of, of women and families who are prioritizing their children again, remembering that this is their legacy, um, that these children will grow up to be high functioning adults, successful in society, and will continue to grow a more uh, traditional ethos within the culture because the pendulum is always swinging. And so I'm confident mm. that the pendulum will swing back in the right direction within the next generation or two. Yeah. Um, like I said, when we brought my wife home, she made more money than I did. So I had to get three jobs just to kind of make ends meet. And I, I was hustling very hard 
for a long time. And by the grace of God, we, we were able to squeak by those difficult days. But I don't regret it in the least because the investment into my family was, you know, invaluable. Like you can't put a, you can't put a number on that. You know, we learned, we kind of the hard way, kind of kicking and screaming in many ways that bringing my wife home was an investment in the future for all of our kids. We got involved in homeschooling. We got involved in our church and our faith became richer and deeper and uh, only fruit came from that. That music means we're up against a break. We're talking with Angela from Integrated with Angela Erickson on YouTube. Can I encourage you to go check out her channel right now? Go to uh, YouTube and you can look for Integrated Angela. We're going to put a link to it in the show notes, but make sure to subscribe to her channel and share it with a friend. That'd be amazing. Praise be to God. I'm sure she'd love that. The show notes and everything is going to be up at the top of the hour over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Trad Jack Burton, Tweed and Toe will get those up for you. And everything we talk about will be posted there to include my expose on CRS. I would really appreciate it if you'd share that today. Not just because I want a lot of views, but because I want a lot of Catholics to come to the knowledge that CRS is up to no good and the bishops need to stand up and do something about it. More with Angela coming up after the break. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain. It's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Coming up at the top of the hour, we say goodbye to the radio. We stay on the live video feed for the after show, and we take your comments. Whatever you want to talk about is on the docket and if you fail to bring anything up, Trad Jack Burt and I will just talk about movies and food. So it's up to you to make the conversation more interesting. And you can do that in the com box of the live video feeds. If you go to the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT, you'll find the live video player there right after you sign up for the email list. I would encourage you to do so. And you can also go and underneath it, you'll see YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and other places where you can be a part of the conversation and we would love, love, love to have you on the team. Go to thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. We're talking with Angela Erickson from Integrated with Angela on YouTube. And again, check out her YouTube channel. You can also visit her website, integratedangela.com. Encourage you to do so. We will do that. We'll put those in the, the show notes today as well. Angela, welcome back to the team. You know, we talked about finances there right before the break, Angela. And I got to tell you, one of the other like sort of underlying currents here between marriage, you know, combating the toxicity of the culture, the modernists uh, uh, that uh, infiltrate our families, our friends, our communities, our churches. How about finances? Are we living in a necessary two income home? I mean, because we just got, you know, Angela, listen, God wants me to have the Ford F-150 Raptor in midnight blue. OK, yeah. I know I know I don't ever actually do desert running at 100 miles an hour, but I need a truck that can do it, whether or not I ever see a desert with it. Angela, I, yes, I understand it's over a thousand dollars a month in payments. But listen, it's just it's part of me. It's part of who I am, Angela. Stop right. judging me. Stop judging me. OK, and we get we need to go on vacation. We need two, three, two, three car, two, three. You would say two, three cars. We're going to need at least two, three cars. <laughs> Uh, up there in Minnesota. And, oh, yeah, uh, you know, you betcha. oh, yeah, you betcha. And the house has to be a good one. It's got to be a good one. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't understand what your problem is, Angela. I mean, we just need two incomes. That's the way it goes. Why don't we, why, why are our finances so out of whack? Yeah, that's another great question. And and I, I don't want to uh, paint with too broad of a brush. I think in some situations it is necessary. And I will point to the, the uh, Proverbs 31 woman, right? Like before the Industrial Revolution, women always did work at home and they were contributing economically and men were working at home, too. So the, the division of labor was such that um, men were actually home with their with their children as well. Um, and not only that, but they had so much more support because there were other people, you know, usually it was a multi-generational home. You had family living close by. You had so much more support. Uh, and so I, I don't want to um, ignore that. In fact, I was just listening to a, a podcast with Nancy Percy. She just put out a book on toxic masculinity and really restoring true masculinity in our society. And, and it's just a phenomenal uh, interview that I listened to. I want to go buy her book. But she talks about how um, 
books were actually written, like child rearing books were actually written for men before the industrial revolution, which I wow. found really interesting, right? It says a lot. Um, and so I, I don't want to say like women, you're not allowed to have any sort of income. I mean, I, I do a podcast. I don't make any money. <laughs> I lose a lot of money doing it. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I, I, I don't think that means we're not allowed to have hobbies and interests and have any sort of economic um, influence within our home, but we can't sacrifice our children in that pursuit. And so I do think that if it is truly essential, I think the men should hustle. This is my, my opinion. And this is what we've done in our home. The men should hustle and do everything they can and be super prudent with your finances. I think you're exactly right. Uh, I think a lot of families aren't willing to make the right sacrifices. They want to keep up with the Joneses. I'm not saying that that's the case for everybody, but it's very common. Um, you know, be, don't be afraid to buy a used car and just run that thing down into the ground. Um, you don't need to uh, have the, the latest, most fancy house. You don't need to have all of these things. Um, and also learn to invest. Like, you know, I think men, especially if you're the ones running the finances in your home, uh, learn how to invest and what you should be doing with your finances to set your family up for long-term wealth instead of just focusing on the short-term, let's just get the bills paid for month to month. So that combined with women, if you really do need to bring in an income, don't be ashamed of that, but don't sacrifice your children in that pursuit. Your children always have to come first. And I think if you have a rightly ordered um, perspective on that, you'll be able to accomplish that. Um, even from within the home. I saw comments of people running a hair salon or that kind of thing uh, from their home. And I think that's totally appropriate. Um, there's mm. nothing wrong with that. In that article with Dr. Carrie Gress, she talked about the baby boomers, um, the boomers that came back from the, you know, the greatest generation came back from World War II. That, you know, something you said a second ago, a, a, women entered the workforce in droves during that time, right? Uh, they They were... They had to go fill the uh, they had to go fill the the manufacturing jobs that were now vacant because men went off to war. And That's again, right. they come back and there, a lot of bad things happen in the world. You get the sexual revolution. You get divorce on demand. You get contraception. You get uh, women now permanently in the workforce at a level unheard of in, in history prior to that. So we do see a lot of uh, a lot of issues there. Can, you also mentioned Cabrini in the last segment. I want to bring Cabrini up. It's something we've been talking about here on the show. And there's a split mm -hmm. opinion. I got to tell you, there's a split opinion in the audience over Cabrini. I mm -hmm. watched it with my wife. We went on a date night. I loved it. I thought it was great. Are there flaws? Yes. I talked about the flaws as well. But when it came to the I am woman, hear me roar lines that so many people were concerned about. I wasn't at all concerned about those. I thought they were perfectly fine in the context because the way they depicted her, and I want to get your comment on this, is she is a strong-willed woman, but at no time does she disrespect authority. She doesn't, like, subvert authority over, rightly over her. She's challenged by it. She finds ways to, to navigate those tricky waters. At no time does she blur the lines of gender fluidity. You know, she doesn't try to pretend as though she is... She is a, a man or whatever. She understands there's differences there. And um, and then, of course, she embraces her her role as a woman to care for who? The orphans on the streets of the five points in New York. So I don't know. I just thought it was very beautiful. What were you what was your overall thought on Cabrini, especially in, in terms of toxic femininity? Yeah, I have to agree with you. I think uh, overall. I think people, whatever their preconceived ideas were or whatever, you're going to go into a movie like that and look for your confirmation bias. That's that's my opinion. Um, I read both sides of the debate, too, and I tried to keep a really open mind. And I think those same lines that you're describing could be taken either way. Were there, were there things that were missed opportunities? Yes. I would have loved to see more sacramentality throughout the movie, that right. kind of a thing. I think that yeah. would have been excellent. Um, that would make sense considering she was a religious. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but that was, yeah. but the movie wasn't for Catholics. And I think we have to keep that in mind as well. Um, however, I think that they did a wonderful job portraying her as, as a nurturing, loving mother who was doing everything that she could for these poor children. And she was going to fight. Like I'm, a, I saw a lot of myself in her because I'm not somebody that would be necessarily considered quiet or submissive in, in the sense that I just, um, you tell me no, and I'm not going to push back on it. I mean, it, every time she gets pushed back, she basically says, I want to talk to your boss, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> except for the Pope. But I love yeah. the, the way that the Pope was portrayed because he was a loving father. He was firm with her. 
Exactly. And she respected that. And he, so I loved that dynamic too. It wasn't like she was out to fight the patriarchy, the pa- right. the patriarchy, the patriarchal head of the church was a loving father to her. And so she, she maybe found some workarounds, but she worked within the parameters that she was given. So I didn't, I don't buy that. It was uh, this feminist trope. I could, I could see though, why people would interpret it that way. um, If that's the lens you're going into it with. And so I I think sometimes we just have to keep that in mind. Like what are my preconceived notions that I'm going into this Mm. with? Um, That changes how we see things. That that's a lens. Well, Angela, we're just about out of time on the radio side. If you can hang out for the after show, you're more than welcome. Sci-Fi Mike, one of our insiders, one of our uh, plank owners, been around a long time, Sci-Fi has. He's wanting to know what that flag is behind your head there. So maybe we'll talk about that. Maybe we'll follow up on Cabrini or whatever else you guys want to talk about in the after show. You get to drive the conversation through your commentary. And maybe we can ask Angela for some advice on to young moms to uh, soon-to-be-wed moms on, on uh, how to prioritize marriage and family. We'll talk about that and more in the after show today. Just go to the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT to get the show notes, to join the insider crew on the email list, the podcast, and much, much more. And please do me a favor and share the CRS expose off the YouTube channel today. I'd be grateful. God love you. See you tomorrow. And we're back. Welcome to the after show, everyone. And uh, Angela will be joining us, Joe, but uh, she has to go tend to some motherly duties for one second, and she'll be back. <laughs> All right. Sounds good to me. Hey, Jen Nugent, good morning to you. Paul, our friend from Buffalo. Good to see you here, my friend. Thanks for hanging out with us. Damon, good morning to you. Troy Lockett is on the team. Sharon, good morning to you. Hope you're feeling good, Sharon. Um, Damon, again, Trad Jack Burton, I see you there. Mike K, good morning to you. The Brick Wall, our friend from Virginia. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Scrolling backwards. Um, Eileen, good morning to you. Karen Indy Bashaw, good morning. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Sharon says, by the way, my contribution to Catholic femininity is that I fly like a girl. I will say that I always thought I should be home with the kids, but society, blah, 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 blah. Looking forward to hearing your guest. <laughs> That's probably a very common story, by the way. Mimi Sky, good morning to you. Good morning to you. James, 16897. By the way, that's a super cool. I can't wait to read that article you posted in the Inside Telegram group there, James, on uh, Late Night Catechism. Uh, you, does, do you guys know Late Night Catechism? Has anybody ever heard of that? You ever seen anything? I I, I, I got to go back and look because it's been a long time, and I can't remember, was it? Was it sketchy or not? I forget. I got to go back and read your article. But it's been a lot. It's been a number of years since I watched or heard anything from late night. It was a comedian that traveled around to like a one, a one, uh, a one character show. And she played a nun and uh, kind of funny, but maybe I should feel guilty. I don't know. I got to go back and review it because it's been a while. Um, Jeff Burrier is on the team. Good morning to you, Jeff. Praying, praying for you and for your surgery happening today. Please keep Jeff in your prayers. I'd be very, very grateful to you. I'm glad you're feeling good, Sharon. Thank you for, for being on with us again today. Ginger Gal is on the team today. Ginger, welcome and good morning to you. Says, uh, I was blessed as well to be able to stay home with my children. Frank Rangel, good morning to you. Uh, Dory is on the team today. Good morning, Dory. Thanks for hanging out with us today. We have the re- recipes. I always want to say re- receipts. I don't know why. But it's recipes. That's you have the recipes. Sometimes those are the same word, Joe. When you go back to the old days, is it? People would use the same word. Yeah, recipes and receipts they would, are they the would same say, word. They, they would say, "Oh, here, here's the here's the receipt," you know, type of thing for the for interesting for the, for the dish. The etymology of the of re, of receipts, at least in a couple old books. Yeah, can you prove that to me? Could you have the receipts to prove that to me? I, I'd have to look them up. See where I'm going with that? I do. Janice, good morning <laughs> to you. Says, uh, we need women to be like Angela. Yay and amen. Dama Catolica, great guest, she says. I agree. Edwin, good morning to you. Top of the morning, Edwin. Glad you're here. Colin, good morning to you. A strong sacramental Catholic marriage statistically doesn't end in divorce, and a dowry is not required. Traditional Catholic family values and stay-at-home mom has a high success rate. Um, let's, let's, let's push back on that one a little bit, Colin. Dowries are not required. I don't know. I think we should make dowries great again. I agree. Uh, uh, Angela, did you have a dowry that you presented to your husband when he when he asked to marry you? 
Um, no, I was 21 when we got married, so I had nothing. I was in college. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's yeah. hilarious. <clears throat> well, um, <laughs> my wife brought student debt to the family, but arguably no, I, I brought did a worse. Lot of that, so. too. I did that. <laughs> yeah. My yeah. husband is a tradesman, though, so thanks be to God he had, no, like, no debt. Um, yes. That was a gift. Glory be to God. It took us a long time to get to – we're down to just the mortgage. So, you know, you talked about owning old cars. My car is almost 20 years old at this point. <laughs> it's a little showing we a little a bit. I, I love my car. <laughs> yeah, there you go. See, mine's an 06. It's an 06 Tahoe. Yeah. I love my Tahoe. It's fantastic. I drive it in the mud whenever I get a chance. But um, but it is showing a little bit wear and tear there. So, but th- that's the way it goes. But at least I don't have a car note. So, glory be to God for that. Hey, Catherine Hickey and Evelyn, good morning to you. Kilroy Jones, Brandon Joseph Abair is on the team. Says a true, strong Catholic woman. Don't need you to hold her hand constantly. There's time and place for that. Uh, I'm sure. Let's talk about that for a second. I find I, I think if my wife were here, she might have something interesting to say about all that. Um, Strong Catholic women, true Catholic femininity versus the world's toxicity. Where, how much, how much does does a Catholic woman need from her husband in that regard? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I've thought about this a lot because I have been extremely blessed to have an amazing husband, and like you, um, I, I felt like family dynamics were um, maybe not ideal growing up. Less than optimal. (laughs) Less than optimal. Less than optimal. And so, um, you know, you need a man to lead. And I think what people miss often is that it's the woman's job to create space for him to lead um, and to go out of her way to create that, especially if that's not something he is comfortable doing, or maybe that wasn't modeled for him, which is extremely common. Um, But it's also the man's space to protect the woman. It's not just on a physical level, it's not just about a roof over her head, um, but to make her feel secure because, I, and I always visualize it almost like a sphere, like a man's job is to create this protective sphere around his wife and children within which they can flourish. And so he protects them on an emotional and physical level so that she can flourish in her role. That's his job. And so how does he do that? Well, he's not belittling her. He's not making her feel bad for not contributing to the finance. He comes home and he doesn't feel um, resentful if he has to help contribute in the home in some way. Um, you know, she's been doing this by herself all day. I always say to my husband, he, he goes on call from time to time and I say, but I'm on call 24 seven. Like that's just <laughs> yes, how it that's is. That's right. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, um, yeah. there's nothing wrong with men helping in the home and changing diapers. And I think there's a weird fundamentalist, um, segment within the church right now, sort of this red pill movement within men in the church that I, I think they're disaffected. You know, a mm. lot of them are are feeling burned by feminism explicitly. And so the reaction is an overreaction. And mm. so they feel like they shouldn't have to contribute at all. It's explicitly the women's job. It's the women's have the women they have their role and it's explicit and they they there's no crossover. Um and so they leave that burden on their wives and I think a lot of women are going to resent their husbands for being so hands off in the home. And so with the, their children, actually, yeah. um, it's a very short sighted view. So I think that's where men need to step up. They have to be that protective force field around their families so that women can flourish and feel safe. Mm. Um, so women, women just don't flourish unless they feel safe. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really great point. And again, I wish my wife was, was on this, uh, on this chat because I think she would she would have a lot to say, I'm sure, about all of that. Hey, um, by the way, Sci-Fi Mike wants to know, hey, what's the flag behind you? Um, it is it says I tread where I please. It has our lady uh crushing nice. uh the serpent with her heel. I I can move a little That's, bit. Yeah. There, you <laughs> there you go. Hey, I love that. That's amazing. Where'd you get that flag? I think I got it on tradflags.com. Hey, probably. Hey. Yeah. That, that's where uh so we got this one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go. Yep. I bet it was probably there. It was either there or Etsy, but yeah. That's awesome. I love it. Sci-Fi Mike, thanks for hanging out with us this morning. James 16897. Uh, praise be to God. Glad you're here. Mike Peaches is back on the team. Good morning to you, Mike. Glad you're here. Lynn Pine, I see you over there on the Rumbles. If you're hanging out on Rumbles 
and there's 60 of you that are, please do us a favor and comment. Let us know where you're from. We would love, love, love to have you on the team and give you a shout out. Nick, the mic is here. Good morning to you, Nick. Really appreciate having you here as well. Praise be to God. Good morning to you. I see Nick Vores. Nick, are you about to get married? Did I read that correctly, Nick? Uh, congratulations. We'll be praying for for you, for your fiance, for your family as well. Uh, Dama Katolika, good morning to you. Catherine Hickey, good morning to you. The Lost Creole is back on the team today. Good morning to you. Um, good morning. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Let's see here. To do Angel Knight, Laura, good morning to you. Thanks for for being on with us today. Really, really appreciate it. I'm scrolling backwards. Deborah, good morning to you. Uh, Mary Mary is here. Good morning to you. Patricia Matthews, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out. Donna Eberly, good morning to you. Glad you're here. Thanks for hanging out. Karen's World is back. Good morning to you, Karen. Glad you're here. Shouldn't we be more concerned about the state of souls, Pope Francis? Yes. Yay and amen. I do agree, 100%. Uh, Gregory, good morning to you, Gregory. Thanks for being on with us today. Um, Scrolling backwards, scrolling backwards. Who am I missing? I thought I saw someone here. Kevin Phillips, Miriam, Chris Anderson, good morning to you. Becky Dominguez, it's good to see you back on the team, Becky. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Hey, Eric JMJ, good morning to you. Glad you're here today. Praise be to God. Bridget Dunn. I haven't seen you in a while, Bridget. So glad you're here. Chesty Marine, Semper Fi, brother. Troy Lockett, I see you commenting there as well. Thanks for doing it. I really, really appreciate it. Karen Andy Bashaw. Did I welcome you? If not, welcome and good morning to you. Uh, Janice says, I struggled, but I look back and say, I'm glad I changed all the diapers. I have changed. I can say I have changed diapers of all of my children. I have not changed a single diaper of my grandchildren, though. I don't know. For some reason, that feels different. But um, but all of my kids, I have most certainly changed all of their diapers, a hundred percent. Just not as many as my wife has changed. That's true. But um, but I have done that. Yeah. And and no matter what my wife may tell you, I have in fact cleaned toilets as well. Just just so you know. Just want to clarify things right now. Um, tragic yeah, have burden. you cleaned bathtubs after a kid yes. decides to poop in there? No, 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 exactly. Uh, no. See, no, yeah. we don't, no, we don't do that. <laughs> Sorry, but <laughs> hey, by the way, Catholic, a nightmare. Catholic Courage Today is on the team, Wisconsin on board. Yes, but I have cleaned up lots of ugly messes for sure when it comes to kids. Uh, one of my favorites of of happy memory. Was uh, my wife? I think was sick at home, and I took the kids to mass. And um, my uh, my middle child, Daniel Jude, who's now fourteen and taller than me, uh, at the time he was just a a little little tyke. And we were, and I, as our custom, we like try to get to sit up as far front as we can. So I'm up there with the kids by myself, you know, playing zone defense because I'm outnumbered. And uh, and little Daniel Jude decides he's sick. And he throw he projectile vomits all over me, all over all over me, all over my back, all over the pew, all over the floor, at mass, <laughs> and I'm by myself. So good times. It was great. It was fantastic. Never forget that. I'll remind him of that on, on his wedding day, if that be God's will. <laughs> uh, Mac is on the team, and Mac is cleaning a toilet right now. Taking it for the team, Mac, you are. William Jones, good morning to you. Glad you're here today. Uh, William Jones says, alas, I do not see the flag on trad flags. Whew. He, oh, uh, William. Maybe must, I got must it. Be on Etsy. It must be on Etsy then. I'm so sorry. William says, I was Mr. Mom. I did my best, but men make for rough work as moms. True story. True story. <laughs> Catherine says, oh, dear, I hope someone helped you. Yeah, that was a little rough. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I the, of course, pr you know, I'm a I'm a triage thinker. So what is the first thing you do? The first thing, right? The most important, the first thing. So removing said projectile vomitor from the pew was, was priority number one. So then taking him to the back, figuring that part out, I thought I would deal with the, the vomit after. But by the grace of God, others stepped up, went and looked for mops and actually cleaned it up while I was, 
you know, cleaning myself and my son. So it worked out. Thank God for community. Linda, good morning to you. Good morning, Chesterfield, Virginia, outside of Richmond. I, I want to go back to Virginia, Linda. Virginia is such a beautiful part of the world, such a beautiful place. I definitely want to spend more time there. I was talking to my good friend Brent Haynes. He's from West Virginia. He assures me West Virginia is more beautiful than Virginia. I'm wondering if he's got a bias in that. But uh, nonetheless, someday I'll get to West Virginia as well. Sci-Fi Mike says, oh, Wisconsin is new. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the team. And we've had, Jake, have we had someone from Wisconsin on the team before? I'm sure we have. Sure we have. It's possible. I don't know. Uh, if I had been attentive in getting that map of ours up on the wall, then I would be able to <laughs> refer to it. But I haven't. So oh, I see. I can't. I see. So you are to blame for not knowing Correct. that. Correct. Okay. Got it. Hey. Uh, I have, uh, knowing I have is failed half the in, my, in my duty as archivist. As archivist, official archivist of ACT. Yes, uh, they're they're po- in the trad gr- in the trad group. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we call Paragram. a Freudian a Freudian slip. Uh, in the uh, in the ACT Telegram group, they're posting links to on Etsy to where you can find "I tread where I please" uh, and "I tread where I please" for Jesus and for Mary. I also saw uh, one with uh, Saint Michael, but it says "I tread where he pleases." Yes, in, in reference to God. That's I like the one. distinction. Yep. Mary Mary says, we modern women are indeed programmed to reject traditional motherhood. It was very lonely being oh the only the only stay at home mom. Stay at okay. <laughs> I should know that. <laughs> the only it's it's an acronym, so I, I was trying to it like, was a lowercase what? acronym, it was harder to read. I haven't even finished an entire pot of coffee yet. You're asking way too much of me for mental capacity. Uh, stay-at-home mom in the neighborhood. Thankfully, I see more young mothers choosing a stay-at-home. That is a trend, but is COVID to blame for that, Angela? Uh, moms are coming home in droves. Yeah, I think that was a catalyst for sure. And and that's one of the blessings, I think, <laughs> if we can find some from this mess of, of the last several years. Um, it's that mothers were home with their children. Um and so, yeah, I hope that more women are choosing that. And I will say, too, um, I actually wrote this article about the stay-at-home mom identity crisis a few years ago because I, I experienced that when I, I left. I actually used to work for LifeSite News. I was a major gift officer for them, um, and I loved it. It was a great job. Um, but I had to, we were having our third child and I was like, I just can't justify continuing to travel and all this stuff, even though I loved that that job. That was one of my probably favorite positions. I've done all kinds of pro-life work and stuff. And that was a great job. Um, And I remember there was a deconstruction that happened in my identity. And I realized so much of who I believed that I was, was rooted in my career. And I think it's because we're, we're raised and constantly told like, you have so much potential, you're going to do great things. And never once does anyone mean motherhood when they say that. Isn't that something? Yeah, They never Isn't mean that motherhood. Something? They always mean it's going to be in an economic sense yeah. and not in the home. And I realized I had been lied to <laughs> my whole life that, yeah. that, you know, it was a mutual understanding. It's, it's just this understanding we have. They, they're never talking about motherhood when our teachers are telling us that. So um, we have to reframe how we talk about uh, what it means to be a mother and what it means to meet our potential um, because there, there is no economic uh, status that is going to trump being home with our children. That's just not, it's not going yeah. to. True story. Hey, Dory says, I learned at school and in childhood to be a man. I learned to be a woman when life happened. My mama taught me to find and love the very special role of being a domestic old maid in caring for my uh, my aged parents. My dad until he died. My mom still now. Yeah, isn't it something that we sometimes have to learn? We learn uh, the lessons the hard way when uh, when life throws us curveballs. By the way, Jane Steves over on Facebook says, I blame the changes of the church more. My father left the church, a World War II vet. If the Latin mass had remained, I believe that he would have stayed. I also think leaving was not the answer. Oh, I agree. I don't disagree. Um as the church goes, so goes the world, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, you know, if if the if the church wants the world to be a better place, 
embracing the world is not the answer to it. It's rejecting the world and loving the world enough to convert the world is the answer. And and I, something else I've said a lot and I'll repeat is no matter how much we lay folk do, we will never truly convert the world. That that mission belongs primarily to the bishops, their success, the apostles, the bishops, their successors, and the priests and the clergy that assist them in the task. Bishops have to make the decision to get off the fence and convert every soul. And rather than putting disclaimers in the bulletins this year for Good Friday that we don't am- intend to offend the Jews, maybe instead they ought to say we love the Jews so much, we care for them so much, and feel for them so deeply that we want to convert them into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church because that is the will of God. It's not our will, but it is the will of God, and we want to do whatever God wants. Like if they said that, imagine, just imagine. But it's not just the Jews. It's also the Muslims. It's also the atheists, the agnostics, and everyone in between, right? It's the whole wide mm-hmm. world. And until we hear that message from the church, well, you're going to get more of the same. And by the way, I saw I saw uh, uh, some pictures. There's obviously a, uh, there was a report out, and these were still shots from a video of uh, the efforts from from the Hasidic community to rebuild the third temple. And they're they have actual they've built some parts to practice the ceremonies with. And the red heifer has been shipped over. The red heifer, which, by the way, that came from Texas, shipped to Israel, helped to trigger the October 7th uprising. So the slaughter that has ensued ever since, part of that was because the red heifer means something. And the the Muslims were like, oh, we do not want you to rebuild that temple on on, uh, Al-Aqsa. So, yeah. We're going to kick things off. So let that sink in. The third temple will be a part of the Antichrist, and no Christian at all ever should want to be on the building committee of the Antichrist. So if you have friends and family, especially in the evangelical community, you know, maybe share that news with them. I think it'd be important. Did I, I, I'm sorry, Angela, you were going to say something. I, I cut you off. No, that's okay. I, I was just thinking while you were speaking about, I actually think, um, a lot of the feminism that we have eventually adopted what really was rooted in the Protestant revolution. And, and here's why. It's because Protestantism fundamentally rejects Mary's role in uh, salvation history. And I think that when we started to denigrate Our Lady, we naturally, because she's the new Eve, and Eve yeah. was the first feminist. And so you see the trajectory of that with the Enlightenment and everything else that transpired after that, the changing of philosophy about the role of women. Um, When you when you strip Our Lady of that, um, you you denigrate women entirely. In fact, I just saw um, Pearl Davis. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she's she's a favorite amongst the, the red pill disaffected crowd and she's a, she actually said that she's reconsidering roman catholicism she was raised catholic but she's reconsidering it because she believes that they have uh we have uh elevated our lady too much and that women throughout history have been elevated too much and i thought that is so ahistorical women have mm. always been treated like garbage it was christianity it was catholicism yes that was true. the first religion that started to treat women with dignity. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, that's why there have always been more women in the church than there have been men. Um, yes, so it's, true. It's something I, so, I say often. Rodney Stark, I say, you go to Rodney Stark, an, an agnostic. He wasn't a, a believer. And at least he had the intellectual honesty to say, in the Roman Empire, he was women. They came flocking because Christianity offered them something beautiful mm-hmm. and uh, and to contrast the horribleness of pagan life. And, in, and they, again, about their husbands. In, women, in, yeah. women thrive when they feel safe. And so yeah. it's exactly, and that, the, the, the arc of the church was the place that safety was found and, uh, and continues to be found. So, yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, I think that is, is where the, the beginning of the end was with regards to um, respecting and appreciating the dignity of women is when we rejected Our Lady. This goes mm-hmm. back also to what you were saying about the, the, the woman partaking in the you know um the the work the economic uh gain of the household which was very common before the industrial revolution particularly it was common in the middle ages where women mm-hmm. you know uh ran you know businesses along with their husbands all these things it was the renaissance and bringing bringing back old roman laws as opposed to the medieval laws of christendom uh, that started tearing that down because it was bringing back this concept of the 
of you know women being total inferiors as opposed to having you know the the proper uh, submissive structure within Catholicism where they still had a, a a vital role to play. It made them completely you know again it went back to this this Roman pagan concept of uh, mm-hmm. of female inferiority and you know back before that you know medieval medieval uh, 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 Christendom was actually quite a uh, uh, we w- we would think of it. You know, a, a secular analyst would be say, "Oh, it was actually way more progressive back then, or something like that," which is not true because it was still within a, a Catholic Christian framework. But it was much better off, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, it's sort of referred to the Dark Ages, and in fact, it's like <laughs> it's the, the opposite. exact opposite. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yes, uh, I was gonna, th- I was gonna say, Zelly Martin. Zelly Martin's business, her lace making business, was very successful. So much so that her husband quit his job and came to work for her. And uh, yep. she followed she followed the stock market every day. She read the newspapers to find business trends and such and, uh, you know, keep abreast of the situation while she was also walking five miles a day to breastfeed her infant child at the nursemaid, you know, and, and, and refusing to take the coach because she wanted to live below her means, not not at or above her means. Um, so a St. Zelie Martin, I think, would be somebody we could look to as uh, someone who who walked that balance between between uh, the world and her obligations as a wife and as a mom. Uh, sh- truly somebody very inspirational, I would argue. But going back to Our Lady, something you said a minute ago, you um, you triggered me, Angela. You really did. I, I have to go did back. I trigger now I trigger you? Now I got to go to my safe space. I, I just, we, we will, <laughs> LED candles because we don't want to do any CO2 emissions here, okay? But oh, um, we're, we're, I was thinking about, um, uh, what's her name? Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. And the visions that she had of the Blessed Mother in the life of the Holy Family, something I've, I went through this, this Lenten season. And the Lord, she was so submissive to her son. And the tradition of the church and the visions of Anne Catherine Emmerich or uh, Mother Mary of Agrida, um, they both uh, sort of indicate that the infant Jesus could speak perfectly even at birth, which would be incredibly weird to us, right? Like that's... Like that's our mind can't fathom how an infant child could have rational conversation. But but the tradition is that both the Blessed Mother when she was a baby and and her divine child at birth could have full conversations. So in her visions, the Lord, as a as a toddler, even gives she asks him. She wants a rule to live by a rule. And it was the child, Jesus, who provides her the rule. And uh, as he grows older, uh, there's even talk and mentions of how he will provide her humiliations, not to insult or to be mean, but to iron sharpens iron, so to speak, you know? And so, and mm-hmm. she would encounter like, say the child Jesus, the, to use the examples, the child Jesus wouldn't look at her or he wouldn't, he would speak curtly, not like rudely, but like short, sweet and to the point, not warm, not affectionate kind of thing. And she would experience that and unlike you and I would be, we would be offended by that and we would react defensively in that regard. Whereas she would recognize this is the will of God and therefore God wants me to experience this. And so God's will be done. So there's this, there's all these examples, you know, in the life and the, through the visions of blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, where our lady to your point being like sort of the first feminist but the first feminist who embraces the authentic and the ideal, a, a woman who understands her place has to accept it. And she, you know, humility, for instance, all generations are going to call me blessed. That doesn't sound very humble. No, it is humble. It's humble because she recognizes in the troubling statement of the of the Archangel Gabriel that she is the queen mother, that she is the Gibi Ra. She is the, the mother of the redeemer of mankind, the mom of God. And she was like, that's a big thing. That's a huge statement. And Mm -hmm. um, most people would say, I can't deal with that. St. Joseph was like, I can't deal with this. Um, But not her. She accepts it because that's God's will. And so whatever God wants is what she wants. And I think that's really at the heart. How many women today are really asking themselves, what does God want for me? What does God want for my marriage? What does God want for my children? And am I living that ideal? Versus what do I want? And I think it's a lie. The world wants you to say, what do you want? You deserve, you deserve to be happy. You do you, boo. I mean, how many times have we heard that? Angela, go ahead. 
Well, yeah, and I and I would just for to be clear, I think Eve was the first feminist, and and Our Lady was she's the new Eve, so she undo, undoes all of that damage, right? Um, I don't think Our Lady was a feminist at all, uh, but. Um, more to your point, I do think that that's exactly it. But a, a, a culture ha- that has rejected God is going to naturally make an idol of themselves or an idol of of anything else. Um, and it's not just the women that do this, but it's the men too, because often, like I said earlier, uh, men want their wives working. Uh, they want their wives to provide financial security for them, not the other way around. And so um, men also have to start asking themselves, what does God want from me? What is my role here as the provider and the protector? Um, and women naturally are generally going to follow suit if they respect their husbands. Um, and so men need to be men worthy of respect. Respect is earned. Um, and then women have to be willing to be receptive to that. That's our, that's again, more of our telos. That's what our nature is. We need to be receptive to being led. Um, and I find a lot of women because of the girl boss mentality, they don't want to be led. And so it creates this tension, even within relationships and marriages where, uh, men don't want to lead and women don't respect them for it. So they lead and, and they don't respect their husbands for it. So, Anyway, yeah. and I, I, I throw pornography into the mix as well. And um, yes, have I mentioned my book? Have I told you guys about my book at all? Have I Jake? Did I, I think I might've failed to mention that I have a book about the subject, but book? Uh, what book you book. wrote a book. Well, yeah, exactly. What book? Don't, don't buy my book. Please don't buy my book. But uh, pornography uh, emasculates men and it's a two for one special. The devil gets both men and women through pornography um, you know, and something I've talked about a lot is, uh, you know, the society that's pornified in which our society clearly is pornified. Um, women put themselves in situations t- to do crazy things to get the attention of men. And then they struggle with the girl boss thing that you just talked about. So there's a duality in their own mind on that. They want men's attention, but at the same time, they want to reject men at this, you know, so it's, it's this bizarre tug of war in the brain Keep and the soul. And men prefer the fantasy over reality. So, they're buying a lie, and then there's a tug of war in their heart, and essentially both are making bad choices, and society suffers. Marriages fall apart, break down, or never happen. The children are born out of wedlock and have a perpetuating this terrible example of fatherlessness and motherlessness in society, and it just seems to like just build. It's just a compounding problem, and the only antidote is truth, and that's the gospel today. This is what Jesus says to the Jews. Truth. Truth will set you free, but you have to embrace it. You got to, you got to cooperate with it, you know, and yeah. uh, you got to recognize who truth is. And they failed to, to recognize that, you know, the destruction of the, of the temple in 70 AD was, was the culmination of that reality. So that's where we're at. And the, here's the trick. And this is, we're going to extend time here with Angela, because I wanted to ask this question and I'm sort of building up to this. Janice, don't buy my book, please. Nobody buy my book. Don't don't go buy the book. I'm, I'm only teasing. I'm grifting on purpose. It's hilarious. Excellent reverse psychology joke. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I I wanted to ask you, Angela, for advice. So we I see some folks that are like uh, I think Nick Vores especially was was uh, mentioning that he's about to get married. What do you recommend to young ladies? How do they that are get especially those that are preparing to get married? What mm. what would you say to them if you could? Oh, I feel like I have to look back on my 21 year old self and I just think about what an idiot I was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and people will say, you know, oh, I'm not ready to get married yet. You're never ready. Like you just have to do it. You, you have to get, you have to do it. Um, there's no preparation that no, there's nothing that's going to fully prepare you. But I do think uh, young women have to be uh, in the pursuit of virtue um, they have to cultivate a strong prayer life. And I would try and do that before you have kids. Cause it is a lot harder to have a good prayer life when you have children. Um, so you have to start that early. Um, and I think you have to approach marriage with a lot of grace and create, like I said, create space for your husband to lead. My husband, um, was raised by a father who is, he's a great guy, but he sort of, he was a, he was a pastor's kid. He was a PK. And so he went on the other end of just being wild 
really, he was a good, he was a good dad, but um, a, a dairy farmer as well. And so he was not present in his childhood. So that just wasn't modeled for him, the mm -hmm. uh, being present and, and leading spiritually. And so, um, and I, it wasn't modeled in my life either. And so I had to go out of my way to encourage my husband to find fraternity with good and holy men. That's one thing that you have to facilitate as a wife. And that means making sacrifices. That means being home with the kids so your husband can go to a men's group uh, when you haven't had a break in several weeks. Um, you know, it, it, it's Oof. about being willing and prepared to make sacrifices for your husband. It means sending your husband on a several day retreat while you're home alone, pregnant oh. with, with sick kids. <laughs> um, and I mean, it, yeah. these are huge sacrifices and, and, yeah. but the Lord blesses you for that. Um, and so I, I just really want people to go into marriage, understanding that it is about sacrifice. And, um, when marriage gets hard, you have to pray against resentment. Like you have resentment is sort of is overlooked, but it's really the silent killer of marriage. Um, so you, you have to be proactive and prepared. Like, I, uh, I had a, a sister of mine die, um, pretty early in our marriage on her way to my house. She died in a car accident and we I'm were very so close. And, uh, thank you. Yeah. It was eight years, um, this February. And that was a very hard time in our marriage. I'd had a miscarriage a couple of weeks prior to that. And then my sister died. And I mean, it was just like my life, my world stopped. Um, but everyone else's world kept going. And I remember thinking, um, you know, this, I just, I felt so lonely. My husband was not equipped emotionally mm. for how to be present. And so as a woman, I had to pray against resentment a lot. And I had to communicate with him what my needs were. He may not have filled those needs uh, the best. He, he was still learning too. Um, and so I think we have to have that perspective of like marriage, you go into it and you're learning, you're learning the whole time. Even when you become a parent, like I tell my kids sometimes, I'm like, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing right now. Like I have a bunch of kids and I still don't know what I'm doing. Right, um, I'm yeah. still learning because this is a new stage every single time, especially with that oldest kid. And so you have to have a lot of grace, seek a lot of repentance, and forgive yourself um, and just be patient. Be patient with your spouse. Be patient with yourself. Pray a lot. Cling to the yeah. sacraments. And uh, don't be afraid to communicate your needs and don't feel selfish for having needs. But at the end of the day, also realize that only God can really fill the, the God-sized hole in our heart. We can't expect our spouses to do that. So um, yeah, there's those a are lot like of the truth things there. off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah. Amen. That's a lot of truth. Yeah. A, the letter A is on the team today. A, welcome to the team. Glad you're here. Thanks for coming back. It says, I submit that men who are addicted to porn should not enter into marriage nor into any relationship. Yay and amen. I agree. Amen. Mm -hmm. I agree. I don't think they're prepared well enough. No. Um, and women, I think here's a problem some women have, maybe most women, is they think they can take on a project. Like your husband's not your project. Don't yep. think you're going to take a broken, broken man homes. and fix him. Yes. You're Women only going to make things homes worse. Do that. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is, it's interesting because as I have, um, you know, my youngest is, is just turned eight and then it goes up from there. So most of my kids now uh, are teenagers. My oldest is married with three kids. And um, so we've had a lot of serious conversations about, you know, courtship and, life and discerning vocations and something I've, I've really tried to hammer to my children is, you know, you're going to be, your emotions are going to get the better of you when it comes to relationships. And those emotions, those feelings are, will deceive, will deceive you. And you have to make rational choices when it, especially when it comes to marriage or courtship, you want to find somebody who loves God more than you do and is attempting to live that life yep. better than you are. Um, they will not be perfect and they will still screw it up, but if they're not at least attempting it, it's just going to be 10 times harder. Why make it harder for yourself? Stop taking on projects. Stop thinking you're going to fix them. But I love them and my heart, my heart feels so warm and fuzzy. It's my soulmate. This is my soulmate. There seems to be a lack of rationality so much that, you know, like uh, a phrase I like to use a lot is we throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I don't know the etymology of that phrase. Someone suggests that it came from the Protestant Revolution. Yikes. Anyway, um... I think, you know, the remember, we should make arranged marriages great again. You know, in a perfect <laughs> world, in a perfect world, mom and dad have lived a sacramental marriage. 
they have led by example. They led the way for their children in the in the faith. They demonstrated sacrificial love towards their spouse, sacrificial love towards the family. They walk the walk. They talk the talk. They are the best persons on planet Earth to know and help their children discern the proper spouse. And they would pick appropriately. Now, we don't live in that world. We live in a fallen world where mom and dad often don't demonstrate uh, heroic virtue, sacrificial love. And in the good old days, a lot of times I'm thinking of in the case of like, say, bl- blessed Elizabeth Canori Mora, uh, St. Rita as two stellar examples of how mom and dad set their daughters up with some scallywags. OK, some real knuckle draggers, some Neanderthals. Uh, ne- Neanderthals weren't a separate species. I know it's a rabbit hole, but they were just humans that inbred. OK, just put it out there. They were, they anyway, were the smart ones, Joe. They were the smart ones. No, really, the Neanderthals were the smart ones. <laughs> Not even kidding. They had the big brains. They're right? the ones with the big brains. Yeah, they were the smart there's ones. E- there's archaeological evidence that suggested that they made instruments. They sailed the oceans. They had language, music, and culture. They had liturgies and and anyway, that's the total rabbit hole. Total rabbit hole. But what do you think about arranged marriages? Do you think you could ever see a day, Angela, where you help your your kids? arrange their marriages or help them uh, discern who their spouses ought to be? Oh, I mean, I I hope that we're able to help just help our children discern that. I I mean, sure. I agree with you in an ideal world. That would be wonderful. Um, Sadly, there are just too many factors uh, where we are now that I'm not sure that we'd be able to have arranged marriages. Sorry. I also am nursing a child. It's quite okay. So if you see a hand, yeah, they're <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, once in on the so, action. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> that looks actually kind of funny. Like yeah. it's your hand. You got a tiny little hand. <laughs> so hilarious. Yeah, like little, that, um, you should make that you should make that up. Like a, you should take a thumbnail image of that or something. It's so funny. Praise be to God. Yeah. That's great. But I I mean, I hope that we're able to um to help our children in that way. I mean, and really encourage them in the right direction. <laughs> Yeah, Nick, I Nick was like, I thought that was your right hand. Now. That's so funny. Let's get Trajack Burton in on this. Trajack Burton is somebody who is, uh, you know, I, I don't want to speak for you, but where, where are you at in life when it comes to marriage or your your state in life, your vocation? How how are you discerning things? How am I discerning things? Yeah. I'm not sure what that question means. <laughs> how are you discerning your state, your your vocation in life? Let's put it that way. Um. I mean, I've pretty much discerned it because I'm going steady with an eye okay. towards uh, marriage probably sooner rather than later. So, Hey, now. And so what advice would you offer? Oh, and, uh, you're an old man. You're an old man. You've got this a lot of life experience. So uh, there's, a, uh, there's a younger generation who might be getting ready to go down that road. What, 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 what examples or what advice would you offer? Uh, definitely don't flirt to convert. Uh, stick with <laughs> stick with a stick with fellow Catholics, um, and uh, um, I don't know. I mean, don't overthink it. You know, like don't don't. Uh, we we live in a world where we have just no good examples, and so for people who want something authentic and real, there's a tendency to for us young folks to kind of overanalyze it and try and get everything right and try and, uh, you know, imitate, you know, something we've read or something we've seen, you know, and just think, oh, well, it's different from what's out in the culture right now. So let me just imitate this other thing, this older thing or whatever. And it's like, it, you don't, don't overthink that. Don't, don't imitate um, without, you know, don't, don't, you know, try and play a role. You know, mm. um, this is where, you know, it kind of ties into yesterday with the the, um, you know, you you diagnose the problem of modernity, but you you find the wrong solutions because you're still trying to just kind of play a role and, and latch on to anything that's opposed to what you see in modernity. Uh, mm. you, you don't have to do that. Like, take take it easy. Be yourself and and trust God to help you work that out. Like, just do Put God first. Try and do the right thing, and and the right thing will come along. Don't don't try and force it just because it's something different from 
from what you see in the modern world that's failing because if you're trying to force it, it's just not going to work. There's there's something to, you know, faking it until you make it. You know, I I just saw a funny tweet from someone uh, recently, like uh, you know, people make fun of these the uh, the larpers, the the role players, the the uh, yeah. the people who are uh, who are kind of putting on an act. Uh, but mm. there is something to it because uh, he knew a he knew a girl who was kind of a career woman. And then she got into kind of you know like uh, getting into you know veiling at mass and the and 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 being wanting to be a stay at home mom or whatever. And then now he's uh, he's about to go over and help uh, her and her husband and their five kids slaughter their first hog or something like that. Like yeah. there is there is something to faking it until you make it if you if you yeah. believe in it. But don't overthink that. You know, just go with yeah. what what you, you know. Be be yourself. Be comfortable, and uh, and and let God guide you. That's that's the real the real answer to it. Donald Paddock wants to provide you some advice here today. He says, "Just remember, Jake, the words, yes, dear, I'm sorry, it will never happen again. Yes, exactly. Ma- magic words. Write I, them ad, down. Ad nauseum. You should maybe get them tattooed <laughs> on the inside of your palm or something. Just yes, dear. I, I, th- I think <laughs> I think I think my girlfriend <laughs> will will uh, if you asked her, she would report. Oh yeah, he already knows that. <laughs> <laughs> Don yes, Paddock dear. also Whatever says, you say, dear. Yes, in dear. our 55 years so far, uh, so far the you have to communicate and grow together and not apart. So uh, I think it means to say, you know, learn to communicate early and often. Mm-hmm. Learn to forgive early and often. That's wise advice, Don. <clears throat> uh, Karen Andy Bashaw says part of the problem is that the is this idea of dating. It's counterproductive to choosing a lifelong spouse. Dating in the modern sense includes sexual experiences that harm both sexes. Yay and amen, Karen. That is well said. Uh, Angela, how do you feel about dating? Yeah, I look back in hindsight and uh, wish that we had approached things differently. I mean, myself included, I was dating a a boy through all of high school and it was a very – it was a very bad relationship. It was very abusive, actually. Kind of what you described earlier about wanting to fix somebody, mm-hmm. um, taking on a project. That was me. Um, and that's why I say that that often is is the case, especially if you come from a broken home. Um, it, it's very common for women to be attracted to men that remind them of their fathers. Um, and that's what I, I saw in myself at that time. Now, my husband came along uh, and I knew he was so different. Um, and that was attractive to me. It was the complete opposite of what I ha- was familiar with. And I was at a place where I was finally broken enough that I thought, um, I actually want something different. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to continue in the cycle, but going back to the, the cultural aspect, I was, I had many people, family members, people I love whispering in my ear, telling me, you shouldn't be dating somebody. You're going to college. You should be dating around. You should be meeting a lot of people. Um, You should be doing all this stuff. And I knew within three months of dating my husband, I wanted to marry him. Mm -hmm. Um, And yet those whispers still were present and they were very damaging in our, at different times in our relationship. Um, So we had to overcome a lot of that too. And at the time I just not having a strong moral constitution, not having been raised to um, know much about the faith or anything, I had to seek that out. And when you start to, when you have like a heart, just any muscle, but I always think about the heart muscle, if it's mm. weak and you haven't practiced guarding your heart, um, it, it's you have to exercise that strength. It takes time to build up that strength where you know how to guard your heart properly. And we live in a time culturally where people aren't expected to guard their hearts. They're expected to bear all for the world and to just um, give themselves over to people without any sort of um, respect for their own dignity or for the dignity of the other person. Um, and so when you're, when you're fighting against that, especially if you're not accustomed to that, it's a lot of work uh, mm-hmm. to reclaim that part of, of the strength that you're supposed to have in having a guarded heart, having guarded eyes, having um, a strong moral constitution so that you're not making those kinds of mistakes that I think we're all so familiar with, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah well said. Janice says men and women need to commit themselves to God first and to themselves every day. Marriages are the are the end and flow of life. God, good days, bad days, just don't give up. I'm I'm blind and old, so it it takes me a minute or two to figure that out, Janice. But yeah, well said. Praise be to God. Hey, we're going to run out of time here. 
uh, with Angela Erickson. Make sure to go to her YouTube channel and uh, subscribe to her channel. Share that with a friend. We'd be very grateful to you. But before we run out of time, I just got to ask uh, one little quick question here just because it seems awfully confusing and weird to me. Why, again, don't Minnesotans call things casserole? You call them, what, hot dishes or something? Like, yes. what kind of bizarre crazy is that? Like, it's a casserole. <gasps> Everyone knows this. I, what what no. seems like... No way. Help me understand. Casseroles, me understand. casseroles are, cold, are cold dishes, usually. And hot dishes are hot dishes. They're hot. You bake it. It's still just a casserole, but it's just hot. No. No, it's a totally different breed. <laughs> You're different. Oh, oh, you got to make oh, yourself a tater tot hot oh, dish, and you can thank, oh, thank Minnesota later. Okay, well, there you go. There you go. That was fun. I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed li- laughing a little bit when you and Father Bransage, in particular, <laughs> were, were showing all your mint and soten uh, flavor. That was a lot of fun, but praise be to God. Angela Erickson, grateful for your time today. Thanks for the conversation. I I enjoyed all of the input from everyone. Thank you for chiming in today and being a part of the team. Angela Erickson, God bless you. God love you. Have a great day. Thanks for having me on. We'll see you guys right back here tomorrow morning. Share us with a friend. We would be grateful. God love you and God bless you.